Hi, Josh. Thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. We are very happy to have you. I'm excited to be on your show, Anna. Thank you. Great. So off we go. When the pandemic hit, the world adapted quite quickly. Digital networking seemed a distant substitution for face-to-face -face meetings. However, recently, pharma leaders seem to be getting tired of the online format, missing live communication and experience like eye contact, handshakes, and basically networking the old-fashioned way. So what we see today is that the excitement about online interaction has gone. What is your take on the current situation? Well, I completely get it. Um, I mean, I've spent most of my professional life essentially being an advocate for the traditional handshake, you know, world of events. So I've had to do a, you know, a 180 basically and just uh, change my tack in the last, um, you know, year and a half or so. Uh, people are getting itchy to get out. You know, everyone has this kind of stream of conferences and trips they take in the year, the go-to places where they catch up with old friends. And we've been you know, collectively deprived of social interaction. So I completely get that people are sort of eager to go back. But I would say that we are facing kind of an inflection point in the evolution of our society with virtual events. We have an opportunity now to capitalize on this momentum, right? We, we have conditioned everyone to be happy to be on camera, which is not something you would have done, you know, back in 2019. I was very camera shy. I would not be doing things like this. Uh, so it's funny how that's turned around. I think we have to make the most of it. What people are really sick of is not so much the virtual events. I think it's probably the fact that a lot of these virtual events were poorly executed by and large. You know, people have taken all their content and they've just put it all online. And that's just wasn't fair for people, you know, without taking anything into consideration, like your attention span, like who wants to sit in front of their computer for eight hours. So going through that experience is a little soul destroying. So I think a lot of pharma people who have attended the likes of, you know, ASCO and all the big events, they found them quite draining. And I think the opportunity is with different formats in, in the virtual world. And that's something that I can definitely speak to because that's what we spent the last year and a half working on. And you have quite a unique experience of running both offline professional events and of bringing pharmaceutical events online. So you must be aware of the outcomes both types of networking provide to their participants. Do you see any difference in terms of the results that both types of events can generate and in terms of their effectiveness? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, by all means, traditional events are just great. You have the hospitality component, you kind of keep people hostage and you ply them with food and alcohol and they just stay and they have no option. You just peer pressure them effectively into just, you know, socializing. So even if you're really shy, you can kind of get going. And, you know, we have ways of sort of facilitating networking interactions on site uh, so that we can still help you meet people that you haven't met before, because otherwise you end up getting stuck with one person. We've all had that experience where you, you, you feel safe right next to someone you just met. You're like, I'll just they'll be my friend for the rest of the conference. Right. We don't want that. So but um, also the traditional events, it's just magical. You know, you get that magic of you're in a place where you it's your sanctuary. You're away from your from the office. There's no interrupt interruptions or there shouldn't be. We all know that people are on their phones and their their, their laptops. But. The idea is that you kind of distance yourself from the world, immerse yourself into an environment. What happens with physical events is you may end up forcing yourself to watch content that you wouldn't have chosen to see. And you get introduced an idea that you wouldn't have made time for, but all of a sudden there's, there's a nugget in there that you get really excited about, or you meet someone you wouldn't have normally met. Um, and of course the online world is the inverse of that where it's a completely different activity. It's like there is no connection between what happens in the physical uh, versus the online world. Uh, and I think the mistake we've all made initially is to try to see the virtual as an interpretation of the physical. With online networking, you eliminate a lot of the social anxiety. Uh, you know, I don't really love being around too many people and I'm sure a lot of scientists will agree with me. You know, scientists love being in the lab. That's their sort of safety, you know, that's their, that's their concentration zone. Um, it's not so easy to hustle and to go up to people, especially like a really popular speaker and say, excuse me, you know, I also want to talk to you, but with virtual networking, you can make that happen. So I think virtual actually has its place and it's much easier in virtual to meet people more effectively across, you know, multiple geographic regions and time zones. So, um, yeah, those two things are essentially two different business models, two different activities for, for pharma people who are looking to stay up to date 
and grow their networks. I think that's a very interesting point of view, and I think a lot of viewers uh, will agree with you. Um, so moving on, um, according to a recent survey by clinical leader Iman Pharma Executives, 75% of respondents named virtual events as the most popular way to stay up to date with new technologies and service offerings from vendors, while travel is still restricted. Uh, but could you share with us what other online formats experts can leverage from? Oh, yeah, I think the, the days of the virtual event as we know it are completely numbered, like the writing is on the wall, that's going to change. Um, again, replicating the in-person experience is just, we know that's not the way, right? You, you can't just have a virtual booth and expect people to turn up and get educated about your services or products. It's boring without the charming reps, without the promotional pens or whatever else you give out. I'm sure you have your own promotional materials. It's not the same, so it doesn't attract people. Uh, you know, all of those kind of things, like the full day events, they don't attract people. So um, what you'll probably see a lot more, and I'm completely, you know, it's very difficult to formulate, you know, an, an educated sort of prediction about, about the future. At this point, it's all feeble, but the industry is very much in flux, right? So there's other formats emerging. I think fundamentally, we need to keep our events short. So we now know that that's what should happen. But what tends to happen in that case is the networking gets sacrificed. You know, the shorter the event, the more risky it is to do networking. And people tend to sort of get rid of that because it's easy to talk yourself out of networking. You're, in, you're at home in your pajamas and you, you're like, ah, maybe not, you know, not today. I'll just watch the content. But we know that people like the idea of networking. They just don't want to do it. So I think fundamentally what we have to do is we have to try harder to embed the networking within the content to actually make that attractive and, and to uh, appeal to people who want to participate. And we can also leverage you know, analytics and data to bring the right people together and keep the uh, discussions uh, focused. When we do those things, then we are essentially going to be substituting like the dreaded webinar. And that's where I think the industry is, is going because that has more longevity beyond the pandemic. It's not just about fixing uh, a, a short-term problem, but it's about um, looking forward to the future and understanding that there will be a place for virtual. They will just be shorter meetings, the ones that you'd never travel to. And uh, that's the bet we're placing as well with our event format and the, the virtual uh, event platform that we've developed in-house. Um, we interviewed many scientists after doing events that way uh, even nine months after the events we did last summer, and people would tell us, you know, yours is the only virtual event I actually participated in. There's still many scientists who would just look at the whole sort of two-day program and go, no, I have to be in the lab I, or I have to be doing something productive. No one's going to give me the time off to just watch TV for two days. Uh, what we offered them was, you know, here's a one-hour event that you can easily attend. It summarizes all the content you might um, need to be educated about. And that may be all you need to do. Um, so that those are some initial signs where you know we're seeing that um, the technology is actually adapting to the reality. And are there any areas or cases where online events come up short? Um, I'd say too many. I think online in general, it's really hard to keep people engaged for a long time. So like even if the production level is at the level of TED Talks, you know, or Netflix. We just have to respect people's time and just cut the time wasting out. Um, I think when it comes to digital transformation, that's really the play here. You know, you can't just take the technology and adapt it to what you're doing. You have to redesign your business model and, and then look for the right technology to enable it. So our disruption came so abruptly that we didn't really have time to figure this out, but that's what's slowly happening now more iteratively. And, you know, an example for our scientists friends who are watching this, um, I heard about the big association meetings like ASCO, et cetera. You know, when, that, when those went online, people have an expectation to get feedback on the posters, um, to go and talk to other scientists, you know, but actually those events, they don't translate very well to the online world. People are posting posters as PDFs, no one's looking at them. So there's no point because you're not gonna get any feedback on the posters. And what I think you have to do is you have to determine, you know, what are the goals of your participants and sometimes it's not what you expect. And I'll give you an example, which is quite, kind of hilarious. I think the best presentation we ever had, we had these like 30 minute talks, right? Your, your old standard like PowerPoint, 
you know, death by PowerPoint presentations. And people were attending, but they weren't really engaged. And what happened once, we had the speaker whose tech actually failed, his laptop died, right, minutes before the presentation. That, surprisingly, was the best talk we ever had. Because what I just said to him was like, well, I don't know, just ad lib, you know, talk about your presentation and, and get people sort of asking you questions about it. And it was the most engaging 25 minutes. People just kept asking him questions and he was describing it. It's just a different way. And that came out of nowhere. That came out of a, a, a technical, you know, uh, fault. So it, what I mean is, you know, we're still trying to figure out that we can't be doing things the same way in person. And I think the key thing that we've all realized in the events industry is once you've taken the hospitality component out of the event, there's not very much left behind. If you take the food, the drinks, the, the eye candy, take all of that out of the equation, you're just left with bland, boring content that no one has time for. Even if you're really interested, you'll just keep postponing it. So I think it's about looking at it very, very differently from the outset. So we've been talking a lot about the current situation, about the present, and now I want to talk a little more about the future. So the future. what do you think? <laughs> Um, what do you think pharmaceutical professional networking will look like in, let's say, 2022 and 2023? And do you think when most of the restrictions are lifted, the networking landscape, landscape will get back to normal? Well, we, you know, I mean, again, crystal ball, I wish I had one. It's nobody knew this time last year that we'd still be talking about, like, will events go back? But here we are, right? So it's really hard to predict. One thing I do know is it's definitely going to be a bounce back with uh, in-person events. That's without a doubt. We're, we're just social animals. We just love it. We're just going to be out there as soon as you, you, you know, the, the gates are open, right? And you're going to see people flocking into these places and you're going to see this like post-pandemic social boom, right? Um, but I'm afraid we'll discover that the world's a very different place in 2022 or 2023. Um, companies may not, it, this will differ company to company and like attendee to attendee, but there may be fewer budgets. If there's a virtual alternative, uh, companies might tell their employees, well, actually, you know what? There's an online event. So why don't you just not leave the office and you're going to be more productive um, not traveling? So there's going to be some pushback from certain uh, entities. Um, so I see the future more as a blend of physical and, and virtual interactions. I think um, the industry is kind of resetting itself overall. So we, we'd be foolish not to take some lessons that we've learned uh, from this past year and a half about uh, you know, how we can use technology um, more effectively. And this new ecosystem will form. And I think it's, it's a very important you know, inflection point in our society that we are going to um, as I said before, like this is our rec the moment of reckoning. Like we have to make a positive change now to make our world more sustainable, and you know to e even stop shaking hands if that means that there's going to be another pandemic. So we'll just have to adapt a little bit to what we've been doing. And you already started talking about it, but I just want to uh, go back to that question. So, do you personally believe in the hybrid model? Again, if we talk specifically about pharma and biotech networking. Well, no, actually, to me, that just sounds like the worst of both worlds, right? Hybrid. It's like neither this nor that. Um, look, for certain large scale events, I think it's inevitable to have a virtual component of like a streaming or a live stream it gives the event a much wider reach, right? For smaller events, like the ones that we do, it's unsustainable, it's more expensive, the costs are prohibitive. And you also have two different audiences that you have to cater for. So, um, and the other thing that I really love about these in-person events is the, the Chatham House rule of, you know, this is a closed community, we can be more open about discussing things. It just feels more exclusive if there's no cameras around. Besides, like, who wants to talk to people that are not even there? That just, I don't see that happening. What I see as a viable like, alternative to the hybrid model will be to use more of a mix, right? Uh, virtual as a pre or a post event sort of gathering um, so that you can extend the life of an event and you can also keep the community engaged throughout the year. Uh, many uh, pl event planners have this issue where you know you get and you'll know this you'll get contacted once a year like come to this event and you'll be like a little annoyed by that it's kind of a nuisance thing you, you know you haven't been keeping in touch with this organization and they call you when they need you and that's kind of what we've been doing so i think virtual will enable us to have more of a more touch points throughout the year 
where we can communicate more effectively with our audience and give them little snippets of what's about to come and what we're working on and like different types of content they can consume more like short form content like TikTok, you know, keep everything down to the bare essentials. And um, I think overall, you know, we can, attendees can also use virtual to choose. Like we have this abundance of choice now. If you're looking at all these pharma events, like if you're a live realization expert, there may be like 20 events in the year. Which ones do you go to, right? So you can use kind of virtual as a, hopefully a free preview of a whole event. So you can make a decision as to which of the events that are out there actually right for you to invest your money and time in. So that would be all for today. So Josh, thank you very much for being so honest and thorough. Uh, from personal experience, I know that this is a very important issue for contract research professionals and without doubt for pharma research from across the world. Uh, thanks again and good luck with your project. Thank you, Anna, nice to talk to you. Nice talking to you too. Thank you for watching. If you would like to be our next guest speaker, reach out. You can find the right email in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe.